Good afternoon. My name is Manuel Roman Lacayo. I am the Associate Director for the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, the panelists for the 10th Charlemos event. Uh, the Charlemos series, as you may know, is um, co-sponsored uh, and led by uh, the LAPIS or uh, Political Institution section of LASA. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having Javier Corrales from Amherst College moderating a discussion with Barbara Stallings from Brown University and our own Scott Morgenstern. Uh, today's topic is China and Latin America, economic dependency and public opinion. Thank you very much, Manuel. I want to join Manuel in welcoming everyone. Those of you who are joining in your first chat, Lemos, a special welcome to you. I'm glad that you are here. Um, before, my name is Javier Corrales and I teach political science at Amherst College in Massachusetts. Um, before I introduce our speakers, let me say a little bit about the Chatlemos series. The Chatlemos series is not even a year old. We started it um, toward the end of uh, spring last year. And the idea is um, to create a Zoom form where we can discuss, talk about forthcoming or recently published scholarship. We decided that we didn't want to do necessarily a panel presentation uh, or a lecture, um, but we wanted to have sort of like a talk show format, a podcast format. And so the, the, the format that we have decided is we're going to invite the authors and there's going to be a moderator today. Uh, I'm the moderator and we'll ask questions. The papers are available. I understand that the papers for today uh, are available on the um, University of Pittsburgh Center for Latin American Studies website. And if you would like a copy and you cannot find it, feel free to write to one of us. Uh, uh, the whole point is to disseminate uh, these new ideas. Um, so um, let me introduce our star panelists, our, our star uh, our participants. Um, we have with us Barbara Stallings, who is the William R. Rhodes Research Professor at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs and Editor of Studies in Comparative International Development. Um, Barbara Stallings has, this is truly impressive, I have to say, Barbara, a PhD in economics from Cambridge University and another PhD in political science from Stanford University, remarkable. Um, prior to joining Brown, uh, she was director of um, Economic Development Division of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean in Santiago de Chile, and Professor of Political Science at University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's the author or editor of 16 books and a number of articles. We should also mention, because this is very germane to today's topic, that she has been teaching in China for about three, four months per year. She's been doing this for the last seven years at uh, Xinhua University in Beijing. This year you're doing this uh, like almost everybody else uh, online. Oh, no. um, we also have Scott Morgenstern, who uh, is the founding person for Charlemos, as well as a number of other great initiatives. And finally, we get a chance to hear Scott talk about some of his most recent research. Let me say a little bit about Scott. Scott is professor of political science at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, he has a, a PhD in political science from UC San Diego. He has served as director of Pitt Center for Latin American Studies. And his research focuses on political parties, electoral systems, legislatures, with, of course, a specialization on Latin America. He has authored two books, Are Politics Local? The Two Dimensions of Party Nationalization Around the World, from Cambridge University Press, and Patterns of Legislative Politics, Roll Call Voting in the United States and Latin America's Southern Cone, also from Cambridge University Press. He has a number of uh, edited volumes. One of them is about Cuba. One day we may have a chart lemos about that, but today um, <laughs> we may talk about Cuba tangentially, uh, uh, but um, it's uh, great to have you both. Um, let me uh, uh, say that the, one more thing. Um, the paper that we're going to be talking about from Barbara Stallings is entitled "Dependency in the Twentieth in the Twenty First Century," and the paper 
um, that Scott is going to be talking about is a, actually a co-authored paper with it's Scott and Asbel Bojigues from the University of Salamanca, and it's entitled Battling for the Hearts and Minds of Latin Americans, Covariance of Attitudes Toward the United States and China. It's forthcoming, I believe, in Latin American Research Review, Barbara's paper is already out as a Cambridge Elements. Mm -hmm. Welcome both. Good to have you here. Um, let's uh, let me start, Barbara, by um, uh, asking you the question uh, of how. I mean, the, the the decision by a scholar today to decide to work on dependency theory seems to be very bold. Tell us a little bit about how you arrived to to this uh, uh, decision to say, you know, let's analyze uh, China Latin America relations revisiting dependency theory. Well, thank you very much, Javier, for um, your role in inviting me to this. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, the answer to your question is very simple. I was asked to do it. Um, the editor of one of the many Cambridge University Press element series called um, Elements in Politics and Society in Latin America um, originally had the idea um, that they would start out their series by investigating um, the current status of concepts that developed in Latin America, but which traveled elsewhere. Dependency was an obvious example of this. Um, bureaucratic authoritarianism would have been the nether. They eventually abandoned, as far as I can figure, this idea, leaving me sort of stranded, answering questions like, why did you possibly decide to use dependency theory? Um, I had written about dependency theory off and on for a long time, um, going back to um, a paper which I published as a graduate student in the days, you'll know how long ago this is, in the days when graduate students did not publish. Now you can't get a job if you haven't published. But nobody ever heard of graduate student publishing. This was a paper for a seminar. It was called Dependency in Africa and Latin America. Um, and then um, I tried to resuscitate dependency theory um, in the 1990s in an edited volume in a project a number of us were doing. And people thought it was pretty weird also then. And so then I come in the year 2020 and I'm invited to do this sort of two pronged um, set of instructions. One to talk about, give an overview of dependency theory per se. And the other would be to try and use it um, to discuss China, Latin American relations. So, um, I so did you're that. glad it's going back to uh, 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 earlier work and actually uh, uh, a frequent preoccupation. That sounds great. Now, how about you, Scott? How does a person studying legislatures become interested in geopolitics? Tell us about that. <laughs> well, the, the the magic of tenure, I guess, is the short answer that allows you to do all kinds of different things. Um, you know, I started my career, as you suggested, on legislatures when it was a time that uh, countries were coming out of dictatorships still, or it had been relatively soon. And so that was kind of the interesting thing, you know, how do these new democracies, are they going to function? Um, but for a long time, I've been teaching a class on U.S. Latin American relations. And so it's always been a fascinating topic of mine. And Barbara, I use uh, your, your book, Bankers to the World, as a central part of, of what, what I do in that. Um, but, uh, you know, so what the, the other piece of it, though, is that because of the legislature's interest, I've, all, I've worked for a long time with the Salamanca surveys, PELA, which is the study, which is in the surveys le legislators on their attitudes. So with Asbel Muiges, my, my co-author, my partner on a couple of papers, we started writing about um, the role of legislators' views towards China and Latin America. And we have a partner, a, a, a partner paper of the one that I'm presenting here that uses the PELA data the, on legislators and a third that compares the two um, between legislators and voters. And so we have this three series of papers. And then like Barbara, or maybe not extensively, but I've been also working in China for the last couple of years, um, teaching at um, um, uh, Renmin in Beijing and also at the Southwest University of, what is it, Science and Technology um, in uh, Mianyang in Sichuan province. And so this has been a, a you know a long interest that's been developing, and so I'm you know, really excited to be you know have this as a kind of a central focus of a couple of papers now. Great, um, Barbara. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the 
findings in your paper um, or, or claims. Um, one of the remarkable things that you do is to kind of like um, um, extract from dependency theories aspects that one can still use to do an analysis. And you, 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 you break things down in terms of market um, leverage and linkages. But overall, one of the main points you make is that Latin America is not as dependent on China still as it ever was at the peak of Latin America's dependence on the United States. Um, tell us about that uh, point. Uh, why, uh, why, why do you feel uh, confident about that? Well, one can look at any number of indicators um, as social scientists tend to do, um, to trade, finance, um, visits by leaders, um, any kind of um, travel. Um, and that will show you quickly, even now, um, that the relationships between the United States and China, the United States and Latin America are much tighter than between China and Latin America. But it's really important to point out that this varies dramatically by sub regions within Latin America and by individual countries. So today, Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean are still extremely tightly linked to the United States, whereas South America, um, for a variety of reasons, both geographical and factor endowments are much more tightly linked to China. If you look at the region as a whole, then you find that um, the United States is still the dominant external power, but you need to break that down um, to be able to get an accurate picture. And why should we care that levels of dependence aren't that high or could become higher or could go down? What would be the implication from, from your point of view as a person who's been studying development, why does it matter to be able to say that the dependency relationship isn't that tight in, 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 in many countries still, though not all? I guess the easiest way to answer that question is that there are some serious problems that are caused by the way I'm defining, defining dependency. I think the most important one has to do with the kinds of trade relationships. And that is that China is only interested in importing a few things from Latin America. 75 or 80% of all Latin American exports to China consist of four products, oil, copper, iron ore, and soy. That is what China is interested in. If you want to sell those things to China, you can do that. And the consequence has been um, to seriously harm the industrial sectors in Latin America, those countries in South America that are doing the exporting, um, that spent decades and decades trying to build up an industrial sector. Those are going under because China exports in return, they import raw materials, but they export industrial goods. Those industrial goods are cheap enough that they can um, cause substantial damage to the industrial sectors in the countries that the trade is going on in. Um, one particular case, of course, is Mexico, which exports almost nothing to China, but imports a lot of industrial goods, has a huge trade deficit, and is perhaps the biggest loser of all the Latin American countries. So I think it's really important to, at a minimum, look at subregions but also to look at individual countries to understand um, the nature of the relationship today and what it's doing mm -hmm. to the economies in these countries. And I guess one should also look at sectors within countries, right? Yes. I, yeah, yes. okay, and we'll get to that in a moment. Yes. Um, now, uh, I'm gonna come back to some of these points, fascinating points, Barbara, but let me ask, uh, turn to Scott. Scott, yes. uh, your paper is about public opinion, about how uh, Latin Americans are reacting to uh, the United States and now the new kid on the block, uh, China. And um, for those of you who haven't read it, 
Um, let me just summarize two of your findings. First, you're using lab up data from before the Trump era. Let's make sure that that's clear. So, so, and you have newer data to share, but let's talk about the study that you did before Trump comes in. And here's what you find, which is an interesting point in conversation with Barbara's paper. Despite the fact that many countries still have a stronger level of dependence with the United States, favorable views of the United States in Latin America continue to be more frequent than favorable views of China, if I understand correctly. Now, there's more variation. There are, there's more dislike of the United States, but the, the number of Latin Americans who still, ha who still have a, a favorable view of the United States, and you have different measures of it, um, is still very strong. Can you say more about that finding and correct me if I mischaracterized it? Yeah, that was, that was mostly right. Um, so we look at three different questions in the survey. One is um, they ask the, the respondents, what is your view about the influence of China and the United States, two separate questions in our country. One is, do you trust the government of the United States, trust the government of China? And the third is a question that um, uh, uh, um, they ask, which of the following list of countries would you prefer to as a better development model for your country? Um, and so then we compare and contrast these, these three questions. And as you rightly said, what we mostly find, well, the first thing that we find is that there's much more variance um, in attitudes towards the United States. So in Argentina, um, 20, a small, uh, just about 20% of the people say they have a favorable view of the United States on these questions. They vary, of course, amongst the three of them. And in some of the Central American countries, it goes up to about 80 or 85%. Um, and other countries are in the middle. So there's a very wide range. Uh, for, Latin, for China, though, it's mostly in the range of 40 to 50 percent that come up as about as, as positive towards towards China. Um, so that's the first thing that, that we find. And so then we want to understand why there's more or why and where there is more positive attitudes towards one country than uh, compared to the other. And what explains those that that variance? Um, and, you know, I. At the, at the beginning of this project, we were kind of interested because, you know, teaching about Latin America and reading about it, you think all these people have this negative attitude based on our history of interventionism and dependency uh, um, and multinational corporations and all these kinds of things. And so in some sense, it was kind of surprising that even in Nicaragua and, and El Salvador, you know, where the U.S. has a pretty negative history, there is still a pretty large percentage of the people that are, that are you know, have positive attitudes towards the United States. And then we start investigating the reasons for this, and we find that you know ideology is the is is a driver for the United States. Um, the right more or less supports the United States, and the left more or less against. Uh, While well, these variables don't work at all in explain in trying to explain China, so we have to look for other factors, and we really come up empty empty in trying to explain why we can't find anything that correlates with attitudes towards towards China. So, so what you find, if I may, um, you find regarding China is that China, insofar as there's a predictor of attitudes toward China, um, China has been able to appeal to both the left and the right. Um, uh, do you have a theory as to why that might be? Is it, is it accidental or is that, intention, is, is that a result of China's foreign policy or the level of dependency that's medium uh, uh, as Barbara is, 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 is finding? Uh, to your first part, I think it's both. I think it's both intentional and, and um, or it's, it's partially accidental, but partially in intentional. Um, and I'll get to this dependency part in a second. I think they've been really smart because they've been able to attract the left and the right by staying out of politics. And in that sense, Bar you know, this, is, this coincides with what Barbara talks a about a little bit. And therefore the, the right likes them because they are going to be providing jobs and, and uh, buying their products and things. The left may like them because they're anti-imperialist and anti the United States. And so they've been able to gain some support on both the left and right spectrum. And I've, and I've looked at this data, by the way, you know, as you said, the paper ends with data in 2014, which was, a, which was what was available to us when we were writing the paper. But now LAPOP has 2018 and, and 2016 data as, as, as well, which I've looked at. And in those senses, you know, the, the support for the United States plummets during the the, during the Trump administration, which should be no, no great surprise to anybody, 
But interesting, the China data continues in, in strange ways. It goes up in some countries and down in others. It's not predictable by the, by the Trump era. So again, we find no correlation where it's going up in one place and does it go up, up or down for, for the other. So that's the part of the explanation of why it doesn't, why China's strategy seems to be maybe smart because they're gonna be able to work with whatever regime comes in because they get can work on the left and the right. As Barbara says though too, they've also got a bit of a problem in that they've been associated with Venezuela, which has hurt them uh, both economically and politically. Um, um, but as she also mentions, you know, when the, the, the leftist regimes were coming in, in Latin America, they were maybe looking for a way to separate themselves out from, uh, from their predecessors. And so China became an option for them. The one place I'd like to maybe, maybe Barbara can ask, answer this a little bit better is that, you know, I was surprised honestly, and in, in that she says that the, the dependency is not so strong in these other couple of countries or that it's middling. But some countries like you know, Peru and Brazil have, that where you point out that they sell lots and lots of products to, to China and they've gotten you know, done extremely well for that one decade at least. Um, and so I was surprised that in those countries we wouldn't find stronger relationships. And, and even when we break it down by country and the strength of the economic ties between Latin America and China, between that particular country and China, we still find almost no relationships. Okay, now Barbara. Back to you. Yes. Um, um, I mean, you can address some of the questions, some of the points that um, Scott mentioned, but I'm, I'm, I really want you to say a little bit more about this idea. Really, China is not that involved, that meddlesome, is, I think is a word. Uh, how would you characterize uh, um, uh, uh, the way that China is or is not asserting itself um, to help us perhaps understand why attitudes toward China are not that negative. All right, well, so what I say, and one of the questions that um, Scott asks that we address, so maybe we'll get to it, um, is why I say that dependency is becoming more sophisticated as time goes on. So dependency used to be back in the bad old days that the US sent in the gunboats um, to make sure that they could collect um, the debts that they were owed, or they sent in the troops to overthrow a government that they didn't approve of, or they sent in the CIA um, to help undermine a government that they didn't like. In Latin America, the Middle East, some of that still happens, but in Latin America, that really hasn't happened. Now it's a lot more economic pressure, which is harder to see for the average person um, and um, perhaps even more effective, but at least it's, it's different. And that's what I'm calling more sophisticated, that you rely on economic factors rather than political factors. Now, Trump was a bit of a throwback. Um, he threatened to send troops into Venezuela. Of course, he didn't do it. Um, but he used some pretty dramatic economic weapons against both Mexico and the Northern um, Triangle countries in Central America, threatening them that he was going to put enormous tariffs that would cut off their, their trade with the US, which would have been a disaster since they do most of their trade with the US. Um, and so they were, he cut off aid to the um, Central American countries and he forced Mexico to use its army to try and prevent immigrants from getting to the US border and to keep in Mexico at Mexico's cost, um, any immigrants that did um, line up to um, apply for refugee status. So Trump was a bit of a throwback, but in general, the um, US and anybody else's even China has become, in the 20 years that China has been involved, has become more, um, I would say, sophisticated over time in the nature of their dependency. It's similar and different from that in the US. Um, so the US has become moving from political hardball to economic hardball, and China has moved from um, economic hardball especially with countries that don't have any alternative sources of finance um, to trying to engage more in soft power rather than hard economic power. Um, 
there are actually, the paper that's on the website here is a paper that's a sort of an offshoot of the Cambridge book that I published. Um, and the um, editors of that volume were pressing me um, to try and be more specific about, was it possible for China to establish linkage, soft power, if you want to use that term, relations in Latin America, since they didn't have the history, they didn't have the language, they didn't have the knowledge, um, they didn't have the access to Latin America that the US had had. But I certainly found some indicators that they were trying. Um, and this goes interestingly to Scott's, um, some of Scott's analysis, perhaps in his um, timeline series that maybe he'll tell us a bit about. But I had a student in my program in China who did a, um, a paper um, on um, a similar topic to, to Scott's, um, but on a more qualitative kind of basis. And the idea was um, that when, well, many things to say, clear background item between around 2003 and around 2013, was what is called the China boom, that China was buying huge amounts of raw materials from Latin America. Then for a variety of reasons, China's own economy slowed down and they began buying fewer products after 2013. Latin America fell into a recession that it's never recovered from. And at least by one interpretation, um, people associated China with this recession. And so there were a number of things that the Chinese government did, by my analysis, we can argue about this, um, to try and make up for, to change the public opinion about China, which became negative because of the recession that many people saw China as causing in Latin America. Um, so let me stop there. And if you want to go into any of those points more specifically, um, we can do that. But really yeah. important um, overall um, picture. And um, Scott, I guess all of your data are, but the 2014 data are just as the downturn was beginning. So if you were to compare your 2014 with the 2018 data, I would be real interested in um, having a look at that and see if there actually is this downturn, which I have been claiming based on my students' paper um, that there was um, after 2013, 2014. Scott? Um, I have a, you know, I've, I've been putting this together and I would say your student's partly right. Um, <laughs> because in a I'm glad he's at least partly right. <laughs> partly right. It's gone down in a few countries, but it's gone up in others. Um, and uh, I can turn my table and look at it specifically, but it was kind of surprising. You know, again, in the United, for the United States, it goes down in most countries, although not everywhere. Argentina, for example, doesn't go down much for, um, um, for the United States. But to, towards China, I should go back and grab the, the numbers, but it's, it's not a significant change um, in most countries, and there is an increase in, in others. I do think you're right. Um, although I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the cause of it, or if this is part of China's overall strategy of doing more to build the bridges or linkages, as you talk about. Yeah. Um, I know Evan Ellis is on the call, and I know he has is, is also talked about this. I mentioned it in my paper, but it's not a focus, about all of the ways that China has been trying to build those linkages, um, including um, high-level visits by, you know, for example, um, you know, Confucius Institutes and aid and um, cultural exchanges and all kinds of things that they're trying. Yes. Now, they are in a huge deficit compared to the United States on doing that. We've been doing it since, you know, Walt Disney's trip, you know, in 41 or something. Um, and, you know, not to mention the uh, 50 million people that are tied to the United States by, you know, uh, um, immigrants and their, you know, and their uh, descendants and, yes. and things. So, right, right. So it's a um, different game that, that, that sure. China play in terms of catch-up. Um, let me uh, actually, uh, Scott, since you mentioned Evan Ellis, he's, uh, he's on the call. Thank you, Evan, he's for being there. He's got five questions already. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, uh, let me, let me uh, take one from him that I think is very important. And then I also want to take another one from Alejandro Bonvecchi, who uh, is also here. So uh, a question from Evan Ellis is, 
Could one say that uh, the sophistication in China's approach to the region has something to do with the, the fact that um, it varies by regime type, that in some regimes where the rule of law is stronger, democracy is stronger, they play uh, uh, by different rules in more autocratic setting. I'm, I'm, I'm adding words to Evan's uh, uh, question, but uh, to help us think about uh, China is different depending on the regime it is interacting with. And um, Alejandro uh, has a question for Barbara and for uh, Scott. For Barbara, if you had to provide ponderations for the dimensions of dependency that you identify, which would be most important nowadays for China? And uh, from Alejandro, the question to Scott is, did you consider measuring the economic ties of countries to the United States and China using imports or variation of employment sectors affected by imports from these countries? If exports, particularly to China, are typically concentrated on raw materials, the employment effects of the relationship would probably be smaller than those in import competing sectors. So uh, again, going back to uh, uh, studying this relationship according to sectors. So, one about regime, another one about uh, sectors and levels of dependency that are important for China. Um, Barbara, do you want to um, sure. you want to take take the mic? Um, I'm not sure if in the um, paper that was online um, I discuss this exactly what Evan is talking about. It's certainly in the book. Um, I divide in a pretty simplistic way. Um, countries that um, adhere to, are, are proud of adhering to rule of law, of rules for government procurement, of rules for what's usually called in Latin America concessions, um, infrastructure projects, etc. And other, and these are countries basically that have a lot of alternatives. Um, they're regarded as um, good government countries, and so they have access to the international capital markets, often at better terms than they would have from the Chinese policy banks. Other countries, which the most prominent, of course, is Venezuela, but also Ecuador under Correa, um, Argentina under um, Cristina, um, Nicaragua, Countries that don't have alternative sources, um, especially of finance, and therefore are reliant on China and are willing to go into back rooms and sign deals with no transparency whatsoever. So these are the two groups that I divide Latin American countries into, which sort of sounds like what Evan um, has in mind. And indeed, there are differences, I think important differences, um, that arise from this distinction. Um, the countries that have more alternatives and that are more concerned about rule of law and transparency generally have China behaving better. China has learned over these nearly 20 years now that if they're going to play in the Latin American um, game for these more sophisticated, better governance countries, that they've got to play by the rules that are set out. This goes into one of the questions I think you want to talk about, perhaps the environment. It goes to labor relations, um, but it goes into a series of issues that um, if the countries lay out rules, China is increasingly um, willing to at least try to obey those rules. And so if um, China comes in and says, we want to build um, a road from X to Y in your country, um, there are two things you can say. One is, let's go into the back room and sign a deal and maybe you can give me some money as a bribe to do this. Or you can say, well, get in line. We're going to have a licitacion, an auction for the rights to build this. And if you win, great. And if you don't, we don't care. We can get the money from somebody else. So there's very different behavior in, this goes back to what, um, what was his name um, that wrote the, the foreign affairs, or the, no, the foreign policy piece about good Latin American countries and bad Latin American countries. Um, Castaneda. No, not Castaneda. Um, Castaneda was pulling off of somebody else. He, he then um, followed up. Um, but anyway, um, that's more um, simplistic way of putting it. But countries that are more interested in transparency and rule of law versus countries that 
don't care about those things. They want to get the money or um, the market or whatever else. Yeah. Okay. Scott, do you want to? Yeah. I'll ask those question. Um, well, he says naive. That's the person I was trying to think of. <laughs> Um, Holly, Alejandro's question was um, whether we looked at how we how we measured ec uh, the economy basically and seeing if if imports versus exports might have driven the model. Um, the short answer is we tried several different economic indicators here. We thought exports would be the most important because we thought that that would be the the, the variable that drove a lot of the Latin American economies. In imports we thought would not be. The uh, we did try it, honestly, but um, we thought exports would be the more important variable because it would have created the, the growth in the countries that might have led to more favorable outcomes. Um, the paper, I didn't talk much about the independent variables in the paper, um, and this maybe gives me a chance to mention it quickly. We, we try, ideology is the variable that we measure on a one to 10 scale, and that's the one that works the best. If you, as you move from the left to the right, in explaining Latin American or attitudes towards the United States, you have almost a it's close to 20 point swing in your propensity to, to approve of the, or to be supportive of the United States or to think that their government is trustworthy. Um, again, it, and it hardly works at all when you look at, at China. Being in an ALBA country also matters significantly, um, again, for the United States, but not for China. The economy variable works a little bit, but not really as expected. Um, and again, we tried a number of different indicators for it. And unfortunately, you know, it's at a country level. We don't really have a way to measure it at the individual level very well. And then the variable that we struggled with the most, and um, I think in, you know, in future ways, we need to think of better, better ways to think about this, is this very about cultural ties. How does this differ for the countries in Central America or Mexico, for example, than Argentina? Uh, I, you know, we could all have this imagination, you know, how we could imagine that might work. But we don't have a very good measure of that in our paper, and I think that's an important you know, weakness that I that I want to recognize uh, here, um, because it does seem to be a, a, an important telling variable. Another question from Evan, um, and um, um, can you say something about Taiwan uh, and and how uh, China uses Taiwan in its foreign policy, and and we can place it uh, uh, on the question of uh, is that uh, sophisticated dependency. Uh, and then we have a question from Guillermo Rodriguez. Um, the question is, um, what do you think the effect of the pandemic will have on China-Latin America relations? Will there be any changes in trade patterns, specifically regarding technology, natural resources, industrial goods? Um, Barbara? Yeah. The Taiwan case is the um, prime example of um, more old fashioned kinds of pressure tactics on the part of China in the Latin American region. But even so, they don't send in the gunboats, they try to use economic leverage. So about half the countries in the world who recognize Taiwan as opposed to mainland China are located in Central America, Caribbean plus Paraguay. And since one of China's main foreign policy goals is to wipe Taiwan off map as far as international recognition is concerned, they have been very um, interested in trying to look for ways to try and um, pressure these countries. They're now about, there have been a, a number in the last few years that have switched from Taiwan to China. Um, but there's still seven or eight that haven't. And so they are um, refusing to give any money to these countries that still recognize Taiwan, either foreign aid or um, any other kind of money. Um, and doing a lot of um, counter pressuring. Costa Rica was the first country in the region that switched now back in 15 years ago or so. And so they gave Costa Rica all sorts of gifts um, to reward Costa Rica, but to show others what they could get also if they would switch their allegiance. Um, but there weren't any for a long time and now several have um, done this. I have another student who worked on that topic um, in my um, program at, in China. 
But Taiwan is still an important issue um, for this group of um, seven or eight countries um, because um, it's um, such an important policy issue for, for China. Um, let me say something about the, pan the pandemic impact um, because I don't think that Scott has any data that will help us. I don't have any data either, but I have done a bit of reading on this. Um, one of the things that China has been trying to do in terms of going back to this idea of cultural ties and linkage, soft power, um, so-called mask diplomacy is one of the ways which um, China has been trying to establish linkage, soft power relationships, not just with Latin America, but um, even in um, European countries and in Africa and in Asia. So providing initially masks and various kinds of um, PPE, um, but more recently offering vaccinations um, from the China stock. And so trying to um, further solidify um, what I see as their attempt to build these kinds of softer relationships um, with the Latin American region. Now, of course, this is a bit offset by what's commonly called wolf warrior diplomacy, where the Chinese have become a bit more aggressive around the world in trying to say, we are the best. We got rid of the virus. Um, our economy is the only one that's growing. Um, and the reason we could do this is that we don't have this silly thing called democracy. So if you um, want to have success like we do, then you should rethink um, your ideas about democracy. And I know that Scott does have um, um, a democracy indicator. So maybe he would like to um, tell us what he could find out well before the pandemic about how democracy um, might relate to US and, and China. Scott? Uh, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, we do, I, I, met, I didn't mention that before, but we do test democracy or view, attitudes towards democracy as an indicator of uh, views towards the United States or China. And again, it doesn't work there either. Um, and I guess we can imagine that- uh, Either one? No, it doesn't Can't work remember. either one. Okay. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure that, you know, I think you can think about it in different ways about why somebody in Latin America who's a favorable towards democracy, you know, is not necessarily, does not necessarily predict why you would be favorable towards the United States. You know, the U.S. has a kind of a checkered history right. in right. what is, demo what does imposing democracy mean? And so, you know, for some people who are uh, on either side of that scale, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And they don't seem to care either for China. Uh, again, you know, my prior probably would have been that it would have been an indicator of somebody that's more supportive of the United States, but it really just doesn't work at, at all in, in the paper, uh, in, the, in, the statistic, in the statistics. Um, to what you said before though, I, I, mostly I would agree with what you're saying that in some sense, the pandemic and the supply of PPE or vaccinations it's gonna be now perhaps is part of, could be part of China's overall strategy of building support. We sort of motivate our paper by saying you know, attitudes are important because it implies the ability of the countries to then have to continue or build their continued foreign relations in, in different ways. And this is why China is spending time and effort and money on things like trips and, and, and uh, cultural exchanges and, and scholarships and these yep. kinds of, yep. kind of things. Um, and the one country that, um, that I think would be really fascinating to understand a little bit more and this is not exactly the same as the Taiwan question, but I think Cuba is a fascinating opportunity yes, for China. Yes. I keep being surprised in some sense that Cuba, that China is not more, more involved. They've stayed away from the politics, but as the United States keeps putting its finger in China's eye, you know, wouldn't it be easy for, Q, for China to say, hey, you know, we're gonna build better relationships with Cuba um, and you know, this would put more pressure on the United States. Now, as Biden is coming into the into 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 power, you know this may change the U.S. engagement again, you know, with Latin America and you know, Trump at the going out the door claimed called Cuba a sponsor of terrorism again, and that puts all kinds of new pressure on their economy. Um, and you know, again, it gives China an opportunity to to walk in as an as a uh, with that would be relatively inexpensive for them, a pretty small country. So far, again, they've avoided using that political pressure in the way that they 
they potentially could, I think. Um, let me just ask a very quick question. We have more uh, from the audience, but um, do you think the, that there is a chance of getting the Chinese to become a little bit more flexible vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela and regime change? More specifically, uh, Venezuela is no longer a major asset to uh, China. They have lost influence to Russia there. Could, could the Biden administration imagine a foreign policy of trying to get China to change its views on Venezuela? Just briefly, uh, this because I want to get to other questions, but it's related to Cuba and Alba. And so uh, any, any reactions, Barbara, Scott? Yeah, I have a reaction. Um, I was involved in a, a webinar with um, some scholars in China and in Latin America before the election. I was interested that the point of this webinar was to try and find suggestions for how China could improve its relationships in Latin America. But they didn't even seem to take into account that we, vis-a-vis -vis the United States, how could it um, get a yeah. better situation vis-a-vis -vis the United States in Latin America? They didn't even take into account that we were going to have an election and that the result would be um, that either Donald Trump would continue his hardline pressure or Biden would almost surely, despite problems that are going to come up, um, take a softer line. The fact that they didn't even take this into account shows you something about the way the Chinese look at the world. But what, one of the suggestions that I made was indeed this. So how could China help get better relations with the US vis-a-vis -vis Latin America. They could make some suggestions to the Venezuelans. They could try and be a, a mediator between um, the Venezuelan government and the US and allies um, because they're one of the few people. I mean, they, China and Russia are the big supporters, but China hasn't done much. China has taken a very low profile compared to Russia in terms of um, Venezuela. So I think that yes, China could indeed come in and try and play mediator um, in a way um, if they wanted. Interesting, to. interesting. Scott, I, I don't, I don't really have an insight on the ability of them to play mediator. But I think that what is interesting is that they've messed up. It's been very costly for them to be involved in Venezuela. Yeah. In a way that most of their other foreign policy adventures have not. I think it's financially it's been a dis, you know disaster. Um, they lent them huge amounts of money and built you know to for, for oil that's not able they can't deliver now. Uh, and politically, it's awful to be involved with this regime. So I'm not sure what their next step is, except for moving away from it. So maybe if there's a more positive way to be that for them to be involved as media, I think that's fascinating as an idea. I don't know if they you know they haven't really taken that role as far right. as. I'm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me just say um, one thing about sure. um, the losses they've taken compared to the U.S. Both the U.S. through the bond market and China through its policy banks lent somewhere around $60 billion to Venezuela. The U.S. is still owed $60 billion by Venezuela. China is owed $20 billion because they paid off in oil over these years. So the Chinese were smarter um, than perhaps their American counterparts in terms of how to get repaid. They still are owed $20 billion and they wanna get that money back in part because if it ever leaks out at home that they have lent this money and can't get it back, this would bring yet more um, problems for the Chinese government in its own home political base. Yeah, that, that's one example of one case that seems to be far more dependent on China if, if, or that where China has more leverage. Um, all right, we have seven minutes left and I wanna get to three questions and you guys can choose which one to do, but we're gonna have to be very brief. There's a great question from Jonathan Hartlin um, uh, thinking, you know, in an era where uh, um, Latin America could play China and the United States mm -hmm. off of each other, uh, is that still possible? Does that, does that lessen levels of dependency, the fact that there are two superpowers that Latin American countries can go to? Uh, we have a question from Vergara Monica. Um, uh, um, 
the uh, this ease of China to get alliances with governments of the left and the right would have to do with a policy of non-interference in domestic affairs that China promotes. So this question of the, the, the policy of non-interference. Um, Nestor Castaneda, um, has the recent decline of Chinese demand for primary raw materials weakened China's influence? And finally, actually four questions a lot, but from Daniela Andrea Sardon, um, um, what might be the consequences of Latin America's growing dependence on China on poverty rates and the future of development? Is there something about this relationship that is affecting poverty indices in the region? Um, if you don't mind taking two minutes each so that we can have a, a enough for our coda, that would be great. Barbara. Okay, let me just talk about Jonathan Hartland's question. Um, I think this is one of the single most important things that Latin American governments can do today, almost all Latin American governments, and that is to try and maintain as diversified a portfolio of international partners as possible. And yes, um, I think the US and China can be played off against each other. Um, Europe is a very important additional partner um, in this story. Other Asian countries, Japan, Korea, Singapore, etc. So I'm involved in a, a project out of um, Chile, but for Latin America as a whole called Active Non-Alignment. This is what they are promoting. And it's basically diversification of your relationships and to avoid at all possible cost being caught in the vice between the US and China saying, you have to be on our side, the way the US and the Soviet Union did back in the Cold War days. So yes, I think they can be, this leverage can be obtained by Latin American countries if they can get their act together, especially if they could join forces with various Latin American countries, but that's probably asking too much, um, but at least um, for individual countries to try and avoid getting caught between the two and to see how they can get as many resources as possible from each. Thank you. Uh, Scott? Um, that was also the question that I was going to try to tackle. <laughs> you're, you're much more the specialist than I am on that. I just want my, my very short reaction to that is I'm, I'm curious about how well Latin Americans have learned from the long experience of being dependent on the US or other parts of the West. And I think that the leaders and the bureaucracy, et cetera, are much more sophisticated in thinking about these things, partly for having read Barbara Stallings work over all these years. Um, and so I think that, you know, the question is very um, uh, right about what, you know, Latin America recognizes that this was a problem. Uh, and now that they have two buyers not, and not for their products, as well as two players, as you met, you know, coming in and saying, we want to bid on this road that we want to build, they do have a lot of opportunities to at least get more out of the relationships than they had in the past. Um, I don't know to the degree to which that's working. And you're, you're suggesting that the countries that are more sophisticated or advanced are doing a better job of having uh, a, a realistic bidding process and not just taking a, a few dollars under the table might be, you know, really important. And that maybe speaks to the last person's question that you said about, you know, does this make any difference to people on the ground? Or is it going to help them improve the poverty rates? Um, and that's, I think, dependent on the Latin Americans' development of their democracies, honestly. Um, as the Chileans have found, you can't just grow and forget about uh, distribution of income. Uh, and these countries that have been selling lots of products and, and seeing their GDP grow a lot still have not figured out how to distribute the income very well. And so there's an awful lot of poverty that continues, even though you know some countries have improved, there's still a long way to go. And so, you know, the Chileans think that they're they're going to resolve this by a constitutional convention. I hope that that works. I'm a little dubious that a that a constitutional that a constitution is going to be enough. Um, but I think that that's partly the answer if they are going to be able to continue building up from the uh, grow from the role of China plus the United States. You know, what are they going to do with those incomes to, to further develop their countries? I think that's a, a great future question. I see we have two more minutes. Can I have one of those to follow up on Scott's one. point? Yes, sure. It's really important to distinguish between poverty reduction and distribution of income. Right. 
one of the few things that economists really think they know is that poverty can be reduced by fast economic growth. This happened during the China boom. Those 10 years, poverty went down in a dramatic way and unemployment went down in a dramatic way. They've gone back up during the China recession. Um, so distribution of income is much more difficult um, than poverty reduction. Um, and that a constitutional convention I don't think is going to get very far, but it's important to keep those two things separate because you can go in opposite directions, less poverty, more inequality or vice versa. Well, uh, great. Um, Scott and Barbara, Thank you so much for writing those papers, helping us think about this. Uh, like you, Scott, many of us teach US Latin America relations. This is such important research. Uh, I personally would like to be able to incorporate what you're saying. And of course, Barbara, your paper is already uh, uh, on my syllabus. And I hope all of you were able to learn a lot from this session. And once again, thank you for joining us. And thank you, Barbara and Scott, for helping shed light on these very complicated topics. Thank you all. We'll see you on the next Charlemos. Take care.